Should we go ahead and get started? Looks like people are dropping in here. Okay. Hi everyone, welcome uh, to our World Climate Webinar. My name is Allison and uh, I'm gonna be your host today. I've got our uh, Chief Operations Officer and Subject Matter Expert, Jake Newton here and our Principal Advisor and Certified Threat Manager, Dave Benson. So uh, welcome you guys. Good morning. Uh, Jake. Morning everybody. Jake, would you mind sharing your screen so I can talk about what we're gonna cover today? Yeah, you bet. Neat. All right, so world one, everybody, once I get the uh, stuff here. Oops. Sorry. I'll come back to that in a minute. All right. Go ahead. So today we are going to cover. Uh, what's old is new again uh, in the world of security and then societal trends impacting personnel, safety and security and adapting programs to today's climate. All right. Well, hey, good morning, everybody. We're going to be um, we're going to be using Slido for this time together. If you're unfamiliar with Slido, it's a way to kind of engage with the material that we're going to be walking through. So if you if you basically scan the QR code on the screen, it'll pretty well automatically take you to the system. If you're familiar with using QR codes, you know, zap it with your camera kind of thing. Otherwise, on the left hand side, you can go to Slido.com and there will be a prompt to be able to put the code in for our meeting time together. So I encourage everybody to do that. This will be where you can send in your questions. And so some of them, we'll try to, you know, if you happen to put them in the Q&A, for Zoom, we'll try to capture those as well. But um, Allison will be monitoring that throughout the time. And then, you know, if you uh, have different things that we'll answer at the end, you know, some will do live, some will do at the end, but go ahead and join there. But ultimately, we're going to have some different polls and different questions that will kind of prompt throughout the time, and it'll populate live on the screen. So it's kind of a little fun way to, to engage with the material. Um, but a little bit about myself while everybody's doing that. Uh, I'm Jake Newton. As Allison said, I've been with CPPS since 2014. Uh, my career effectively started in the uh, United States Air Force, where I was a SEER specialist. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with that career field, basically I taught crisis survival and uh, did uh, planning for personnel recovery, which is basically how you did how you get people back into friendly hands if they're um, isolated abroad or taken captive and those sorts of things. And um, came into the company in 2014, have been here pretty much ever since, with the exception of a time my frame I did with the travel risk management company. And uh, now I'm I'm overseeing all of our administrative and operational functions within the business. But um, Dave, you want to introduce yourself briefly as well, and then we'll get rolling. Sure. Thanks, Jake. Hi, everyone. I'm Dave Benson. I'm the principal advisor here at CPPS. Um, by way of background, I started out with the Walt Disney Company um, for eight and a half years, all in the security division followed by just shy of 24 years with the federal government, the U.S. State Department, Diplomatic Security Service. If you're not familiar with DSS, we're the security and law enforcement arm of the foreign affairs community. I spent roughly half my career permanent assignments overseas in Egypt, uh, Sri Lanka, Finland, and, and Bangladesh during the 9-11 period. Uh, I was very fortunate to uh, be part of the master planning for the 1996 Olympic Games in Atlanta, and I retired as a director of training and performance support for the Diplomatic Security Training Center in Washington, D.C. I've been affiliated with CPPS in some way, shape, or form since about 2008, 2009, uh, and um, the two areas that I focus on primarily now are uh, behavioral threat assessment and management to include real-time real threat assessment uh, for our clients and training. Uh, and I also assist in the um, uh, assessment program, the uh, uh, needs assessment and or threat and vulnerability assessment. Awesome, thanks, Dave. 
So for those of you that are in Slido, if you look at your phone, basically you'll see a, a question now prompt up. We're just curious who all is with us, what kind of industries are being represented. And so you can participate participate there. And as everybody kind of gives us a feel, you'll see the answers pop up on the screen. Corporate security, fantastic. Wastewater, very cool. Thanks for joining. So as you're, you're populating there, um, you'll also see kind of a second tab where you'll have different um, tabs at the top, one for the polls that we're doing together, the other one for Q&A. So if you have questions on the Q&A tab, basically submit those and we'll get those live, but we'll also see those all collectively at the end, um, at the end of the webinar together. Faith-based, very cool, thanks for joining. Marketing from Orange County, California. I'm sure the weather is much nicer there than it is in Spokane, Washington right now. Restaurant business, fantastic. Well, it's great to have a bunch of representation here. Uh, I know when I was seeing some of the the registrations as well, there was some folks from you know higher ed. We've got a lot of corporate, so there's a lot of different representation here today. But ultimately, as Allison said in the beginning, we want to get into what's the security outlook for this year. What are we looking at? You know, and of course, if you've known CPPS. You know us to be largely focusing on people and specifically behaviors that can lead people to do certain things. But we want to look at what's kind of the outlook for these sorts of issues throughout this year and maybe even a little bit more long term. And more specifically, you know, what can we do about it as collective individuals tasked with keeping everybody safe? So in three words or less, what would you say as an audience is your largest concern? going throughout this year. We have an election year, um, which means various things that we're going to talk about. But if you had to kind of boil it all down, what's the, what's your biggest concern regarding your people, keeping your people safe and secure for this year? And this will be kind of our launching point for our discussion. Terrorism threats. Okay, that's a fantastic one. Crime, okay, active assailant, travel security, cyber, social instability, active shooter, targeted violence. A lot of fascinating things. Dave, any thoughts that come to mind as you're kind of seeing all of this come across the screen? Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's great. First of all, thank you for your interaction. Hopefully you find it useful. I know we do. Uh, it just shows that um, the concern, the perception, and the reality of violence, uh, it, it cuts across all sectors. And uh, there is not one particular se sector or aspect of our society that isn't touched by some of the things we're going to be talking about today. So, I, I mean, uh, good responses there. And uh, you'll find that as we go through our webinar here, we're going to touch on almost all of those, maybe all of them. Yeah. And what's interesting about this is I've got one more participant typing in here, but one thing I'm noticing is we've got kind of the real world issues, potential for violence, and but then also things that are touching the information side of things as well, you know, cyber issues, um, things that are hitting kind of the informational domain, but it's kind of hitting all of these different aspects of society. So we're gonna we're gonna get into a lot of these different issues as part of our time together. So it's really interesting that you know, hopefully the things that you find that we discussed throughout our time together are also kind of pertinent to some of these concerns that you're having. But a couple of days ago, we put out a um, a poll on LinkedIn and just to kind of compare and contrast briefly, you know, polls are always kind of fun to do, but you can see there's no shortage of concern in terms of what this is looking like. And I mentioned briefly previously a little bit ago that you know, being an election year that has certain certain ramifications to it that we're going to look at, some interesting statistics here in a little bit. But when we look at the collective stress, there's a lot of different dynamics that have been going on. You know, some some things were even going back to the beginning of the pandemic that are still having its ramifications in effect today. But I think if you had to kind of quantify the level of um, of stress across the nation. It, it seems to be pretty heightened and that inability to cope, um, you know, and, and the 
potential for persuading behavior in different ways. We're going to talk about that. And all of these different things have an impact. And when we're tasked with keeping everybody safe in our workplaces, you know, depending on where they're working, that can that can mean a lot of different things. And so that's ultimately what we want to break down at, at this time together is, you know, what are some of these different issues that we're seeing? But ultimately, what can we do about it? What can we walk away with to be able to address some of these different issues? And Dave, you know, you've kind of been talking about this a lot lately. What's old is new again. And so uh, break that down for our audience. What do you what do you mean when you've been saying that? Yeah, sure. Absolutely, Jake. So uh, those of you that that I know out there or, or know about me know that I started out in the security business, uh, certainly on the government side as a cold warrior. Um, the Soviet Union was still uh, alive and intact. Uh, we had um, incidents of transnational terrorism. We had um, homegrown extremism, political assassinations, kidnapping, hostage taking. Well, interestingly, over time, other things have kind of uh, overtaken some of those issues. Um, but I got to thinking about this a couple of years ago uh, when I was asked by Antic to basically provide a prognostication of coming out of the pandemic, what are some of the things we can expect to see in the threat climate uh, in 2023 and beyond? And then I was asked to do it again uh, in 2024. And one of the th these are things that I predicted, and we always know when we predict things as subject matter experts, there's always a real possibility you're going to get it absolutely wrong. Uh, and happily for me, all these th happily for me as a subject matter expert, all these things came to pass uh, as a resurgence of unhappily for the world globally. All these things came to pass. So the resurgence of uh, not only asymmetric warfare, trans transnational terrorism uh, has has certainly reared its ugly head again. It always ebbs and flows. Uh, as we're doing this webinar, uh, we now have uh, in the wake of the uh, tragedy in Moscow, where at least at this juncture, ISIS is uh, is claiming responsibility for it. Um, but other situations that we've seen around the globe, and so. From, a, from a, a, a travel risk management perspective, in addition to those of you that have international footprints, and even from a domestic uh, standpoint, we have to be aware of these things. One of the things that I talk a lot about is knocking down stovepipes. And so it's not about, well, that's a terrorism issue, and that's extremism, and this is workplace violence, and uh, this is domestic violence. Um, violence is violence is violence, and I can assure you those of us that have been victims of violence in the past, uh, it very much looks, sounds, and walks and talks the same. So the message is clear. We have to be aware of our surroundings, understand how the landscape is changing, in this case, the climate, uh, and how it's it, 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 that ebb and flow and what's surging now, uh, and how that fits into our organizations, which ultimately means how do we take care of our people? Um, you know, uh, uh, the director of the FBI has said on more than one occasion, and he just was up on Capitol Hill again recently, and he just recounted one of the most significant threats that the homeland faces right now is homegrown extremism, such as ultranationalist white supremacists uh, or self-radicalized terror. Um, so once upon a time, we used to focus on groups uh, that would recruit people and they would train people and they would conduct operations and target target uh, organizations, people, governments, whatever. Now, with the advent of social media and the Internet, um, we have several different, sadly, opportunities that these things can come come to pass. Uh, uh, homegrown means uh, maybe they became self-radicalized on the Internet. They got into a chat room. Uh, and by the way, uh, if I ever get to have some spare time, I'm going to write that white paper that uh, radicalization is not just for terrorists anymore. Uh, and what I mean by that is this the same process. Uh, if you have a, a hate group, if you have a, a, a religious zealot organization, if you have a political uh, uh, group uh, that aims, uh, you know, to target and overthrow uh, or harm uh, other people, they follow this process. So self-radicalization, they might get some help. Uh, from uh, another organization, uh, or then there's the more traditional way of, of, being, of being targeted. And, and in reality, 
uh, as I said before, uh, by the time we find out about it all too often within our organizations, um, uh, it's going to look an awful like any other type of attack or act of violence or whatever that might be. So recognizing that this type of homegrown extremism is right high on the, uh, on the hit list uh, for the FBI. Uh, another thing that I predicted is, was going to uh, have a resurgence was political assassinations uh, as a way to um, um, uh, further the aims of an organization or work out a grievance or uh, uh, target any particular groups, hate crimes, all those things. We have definitely seen a resurgence of that, both attempted assassinations and actual uh, assassinations uh, across, the, across the globe. And then kidnapping, hostage taking. Those of you that know a little bit more than the average bear about CPPS knows that we cut our teeth on uh, kidnapping, survival, hostage survival. That's the world that Jake came from. Uh, our, our director of uh, training uh, and operations, uh, Stacy Brown, that's very much her former world. I would tend to look at this from the standpoint of being uh, a government official overseas, responsible for the safety and security of people, and what happens when they are threatened or they are kidnapped or it's a hostage-taking situation. All, I would submit that all four of these topics have resurged in a big way in the last two years. And now when you add a two front war um, that we are either, we are indirectly, but significantly uh, involved in, uh, both in the Middle East and in Ukraine, uh, we have a very volatile uh, uh, environment. So when I say what's old is new again, we have to rethink uh, some, of our, uh, some of our challenges, some of our risks and what potential intervention strategies or solutions are. Yeah, and you know what's interesting about this too is we we focus a lot of times on our own backyard, you know, what's going on in the US, but what's what's been really striking to me over these past couple of years too, Dave, to your point is you know, all of these different things are are really happening on a global basis. You know, what comes to mind even from like a political assassination standpoint, the previous prime minister of Japan um, right. you know, having his life taken, all, all of these different things, it, it really shows it's kind of an insight to, you know, there's there's a lot of issues going on around the world that we as as collective security professionals have uh, have in front of us to help us earn our paychecks. I mean, things that we've not seen before uh, in a long time that I do because I'm old. But for the rest of you that read, had to read about it in books, um, a takeover of an embassy. We had a takeover of the French embassy in Central America. Um, you know, these things just didn't happen for a long period of time. Uh, and so this is, uh, to me, is an undercurrent of tension, uh, pressure, uh, uh, of trying to, uh, you know, get your way uh, to support your way of thinking. And we're going to talk about this also from an information standpoint, how all these things tie in. And hopefully you understand where you're sitting within your organization. It's really important for you to keep up on these societal events, to recognize how they either are impacting your organizations or will impact your organization. And it has to go into your connectivity uh, for policies, plans, uh, and procedures. So one of the things that uh, a phrase that I coined uh, is what I call the weaponization of politics. And don't worry, I'm not going to get on a political soapbox and talk about the left or the right or the center because everybody's doing it. And so what one of these things is it used to be once upon a time, I can remember uh, that I might disagree with a colleague or a worker or a friend. Uh, and we would know to avoid politics like at the dinner table, but we were able to get along and just we might agree to disagree. Now it's become um, uh, uh, basically vitriol. Uh, if you will. And uh, they're the enemy. We're right. They're wrong. Uh, you know, you're going to ruin our country. Uh, you're the sa We're the savior of your country. Uh, and and it the, the, the people being on edge, our late founder, Randy Spivey, hit the, hit the nail on the head just probably this time last year when he said, people have a lot of anxiety. And one of the anxieties is the potential of a mass shooting or an active shooter. And that, that is indicative of kind of what we're worried about. So then when you throw in, so within your organization, if you have individuals that zealotly uh, express beliefs uh, that, that could be detrimental 
to others around you, we have to pay attention to that. This is not targeting. This is not stereotyping. It's just uh, uh, it's just a reality. Um, the pandemic fallout. Uh, we'd like to think the pandemic is over with. Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. But there is some residue from our time in the pandemic, uh, and not the least of which, uh, folks came out of this much more sensitive to things. Uh, you've probably seen this in your own life. You've seen it in your own communities. You've certainly seen it in the workplace. Uh, folks don't want to be told what to do. And when they're forced or compelled to do something that they don't want to do, uh, they've got two choices. Um, they can you know, suck it up, for lack of a better term, and follow it, hold their nose and do it, or they can lash out. And so as we saw during the pandemic and afterwards, uh, uh, mask mandates, uh, uh, vaccine mandates, or even organizations that did not mandate received a heightened threat alerts during that period. And we are just much more sensitive. Um, we, as a society, uh, we are much more likely to find solutions that are a little more extreme, shall we say. And that impacts everybody's safety and security. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, road rage, um, you know, depending on where you are, carjacking is increased in the, in the District of Columbia, of all places. We've had two members of Congress that have been carjacked uh, and other citizens. These are things that necessarily had not been happening uh, to the same frequency. Um, and some of this is tied into the final bullet here, uh, which is the perception uh, of the economy. And, I, and, and I, Jake, I'm going to let you wax poetic on this, but just perception is reality in the safety and security business. Jake? Yeah, perception is definitely a big thing with this because, you know, in many ways, the economy has been doing pretty good in terms of, you know, some things feeling like they've been getting back to normal, especially context of the pandemic issues. But, you know, when you when you look at some of the day to day experience, you know, gas prices are still high for many people. They go into the grocery stores and grocery prices are still really high. Um, but, you know, there's also other things that are really showing we had this, you know, thinking back several months ago, we were having some of the discussions, you know, in the mainstream about like the housing economy and these different things and how how strong that's really remained in a lot of areas. I know, you know, out here in Washington, where I'm at um, here in Spokane, we've we've had actually had a shortage based upon kind of people shifting around the country and and. Uh, people relocating in these different things. Well, for us here in Spokane, our market has stayed really, really high uh, just because of the sheer demand on housing in this area. But, um, you know, whether it's fallout from the pandemic, the collective stress that's remaining high, um, you know, the impact that inflation has had. And while, you know, they're trying to correct that, it's still having an impact on day-to-day -day finances. And when you look at this from, uh, you know, an individual perspective, you have people that are experiencing all of these different stressors. You have uh, actually there's a there's a study that we like to kind of look at here at, at the center. It's called Stress in America that's put out by the American Psychological Association. And they look at what's kind of the big the big stressors uh, ex being experienced by Americans. And this year they kind of targeted, well, how are things looking like since the pandemic and and what has that looked like from stress? And you can just kind of see a continual increase in everybody's day-to-day -day experience because to your point, Dave, while it, things could be going bad, things could be going really good, it doesn't matter. It's that perception and per perception is reality. And from a workplace security perspective, that's what we're having to deal with, whether it's low level workplace, day-to-day -day conflict, you know, having to deescalate interpersonal day-to-day -day issues or, you know, that inability to cope. And somebody finding that potential violence is the answer, and they go down that proverbial pathway towards potential violence. And so all of these different things, it's kind of a state of, um, you know, some people have called it perma crisis. You know, I've I've heard the acronym historically that I, I think is pretty clever, you know, uh, VUCA, uh, volatile, uh, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. You know, a lot of these different things are definitely impacting 2024. And as we continue to go forward, so how we address these different things in the workplace is, um, you know, it's it's getting to be more and more of a front and center issue to making sure we're taking care of our people. Because it just seems like, you know, any way you turn, 
any one thing could cause somebody to, to, uh, for lack of a better term, you know, go over the edge, you know, just the, the coping skills in the season definitely seem to be pretty, pretty reduced, uh, lately. So some of these societal trends, you know, one of the big ones that I'm sure everybody's been seeing, but I want to kind of tie this into the, you know, the state as we're seeing things today is the issue of misinformation and disinformation. And, and Dave, you can, you know, unpack exactly what these are, but just, you know, briefly, you know, that from a disinformation standpoint, that deliberate persuasion to alter behavior, you know, causing, causing people to change their behavior, to, to scratch at the fabric of society and dismantle the trust that people have, whether it's in a, a governmental framework or society itself, you know, this is just one more thing that we're now having to deal with. Uh, you know, and what's interesting about this from a workplace context is so much of this is stemming from the information domain. So there's no getting away from it. You know, you have access to social media at home. You have access to social media in the workplace. Everything's on your computer systems. And, you know, from a from a workplace security context, you're looking at the safety and security of our individuals, how is our conflict management program looking? Uh, you know, giving people that forum where if somebody is seeing something that one person believes to be true, another person believes it to be untrue, and you have that that potential for, you know, butting heads in the workplace and having a means for these conversations to offload so it doesn't fester and, cre and contribute to an unhealthy workplace. You know, so what does that look like? How are we addressing this? Because this is the low level of these different things, you know, workplace conflict day-to-day -day interpersonal issues. This is where some of these kinds of issues can begin. And if they're left unaddressed, they can continue to get more severe. And so this is the starting place, but you know, this is where from an informational perspective, you know, people's, what do you trust? Where can you look for truth anymore? And that becomes really, really hard. So Dave, uh, you know, how, how are you seeing this uh, lately? What's the, what's disinformation and misinformation from your perspective? Well, first of all, the topics um, are, are are on top of mind nowadays, but this is old stuff. This is not this is not new stuff. What is new is the platforms and the the conveyance and how they share this. So, just for the form of definition, dif disinformation is the intelligent the the intentional transmission, whether verbal, electronically, in writing, whatever, of just false information. Period. Uh, some people would call that lies. Other people would call that uh, alternate facts. Whatever you want to call it, uh, and, and I don't mean to be facetious, uh, the systematic sending of in, inaccurate information, uh, we know uh, from decades of looking at this that uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of different regimes, regimes over the years, you keep saying a lie long enough, it becomes true. And so uh, I'll explain how we can kind of combat this versus misinformation, which is the, probably your biggest problem within an organization, right? That's where someone probably inadvertently passes on bad information. Uh, you know, a retweet, a forward, uh, quoting, quoting uh, an inaccurate source. And so what happens is after a while, if these things are left unchecked, it becomes, uh, it becomes people's reality. So as an organization, we have to stay on top of that. That's why you have an internal and external communication apparatus. In the, in the behavioral threat assessment and management world, one of the things I really strongly advocate is a communications professional as part of your threat team, because they're going to help sort out what the response is, what's real, what's not. My mom had a great expression, and it, it I don't know any better way to put it. If you don't finish your thought or a bit of information, someone else will come along and finish it for you and you won't like what, it, what the answer is. And that's really what's going on here. So when we hear disinformation, and I'm not just talking about political, I'm talking about environmental, I'm talking about crime stats. We're gonna talk about this and Jake's gonna talk about this in a few minutes. It behooves all of us to get a handle on what's real and what's not and to uh, provide some context with some of the information that not only you all are receiving from a business intelligence standpoint, but also uh, from uh, your folks, your stakeholders. So 
again, disinformation is intentional. Misinformation is inadvertent, but just as almost as damaging because they take this information and all of a sudden it becomes gospel. Whether we take it from uh, uh, the ridiculous story that QAnon had recruited uh, people from Hollywood and noted Democratic politicians, uh, and they were they were involved in a pedophile ring uh, that was headquartered in a pizza parlor in the Northeast of the United States. And you might say, oh my goodness, that's outrageous. Well, guess what? At least one human being believed that and was planning a targeted attack of that facility before they were stopped. So in this world, perception becomes reality. We have to pay attention to those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about this too is, um, you know, one of the things I'll like to keep tabs on is uh, different things from the federal government, from like, you know, the national intelligence side of things or the national security uh, strategy when that comes out. But the the director of national intelligence just came out with the the threat assessment that they do annually. And one of the things that they were talking about in that is even the disinformation promulgating from different nation states like China, Russia, uh, Iran, for example, and how they're, you know, they're deliberately trying to impact um, here in the U.S. our citizens to change our behavior and how we, you know, from a from a um, election standpoint, you know, go through our voting because they're, you know, wanting to set the stage advantageously for themselves. And so there again, it has that global perspective with this. And so when we're sending people around the world, but even here in the U.S., you know, there's, we have to look at this on a global basis. Um, Dave, how about political, politically motivated, inspired violence? How's this kind of, uh, how's this kind of an issue as of late? Well, I mean, it, it kind of manifests itself in some of the things I was talking about, targeting Westerners, ta targeting uh, certain companies and organizations that represent uh, the United States based upon the, um, uh, the profile uh, that's the geopolitical profile that we're seeing at any given time, um, uh, whether it be, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the getting out of Afghanistan and the fallout from that, uh, getting involved uh, with uh, uh, in Gaza with the Middle East, pro-Israel, anti-Israel, uh, Ukraine, uh, all these things uh, are politically inspired. And so uh, uh, th there's still violence, but most of them are uh, politically motivated, inspired. And that's that's exactly what uh, organizations like Hamas are trying to do. Uh, they use political gains, potential political philosophies to justify the violence. Uh, and we see this all around the world, um, regardless of where the ISIS attackers came from. And, uh, and as we doing this webinar, it seems like a little bit of being maybe a little bit of home drawn, but at least one person was imported in, maybe the organizer uh, of the event. Uh, it just cuts across uh, societal lines. And so we have to pay attention to that, not only when you have people that travel into uh, politically challenging uh, locations. Um, other societal trends, how organizations respond, uh, uh, the coup in Haiti, uh, absolutely politically inspired violence that your your folks could be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, and being someone that have dealt with this stuff actively uh, in the past, uh, it's not just a matter of throwing money at it or throwing means at it. Uh, these things take time. Uh, and the impacts, if we're not prepared for them organizationally with policies, plans, and procedures, uh, can be just catastrophic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. So... You know, a couple more of these folks that we want to share a little bit. Uh, if you join a little bit late, just for, for a moment, we've been using Slido for some of these different things. We'll have a couple more interactions here in a few minutes. But if you look in the chat and you want to join the Slido to uh, submit questions and different things like this, uh, in the chat is the way you could do that. Go to Slido.com, and then there will be the, the pin code for how you can join this actual session. Um, but a couple more of these trends, and then we'll kind of bring this in for a landing in terms of, okay, as organizations, what do we then do about all of these kinds of things that we're seeing? And how can we address this from a personnel safety and security standpoint? Um, but we were talking a little bit in the beginning in terms of how this is, in, in fact, an election year. And I was kind of looking at some of the, the stats about this recently. And if you look at the long picture from uh, a standpoint of crime that we've been seeing in the U.S., we're actually 
you know, for over the past couple of decades, crime is on a downward slope overall. But I wanted to take a look at these last several years because I think there's a couple interesting anecdotes that we can kind of pull away from this in terms of, you know, what this has been then what this has been looking at. And based upon this chart, this is the FBI data. Um, their their annual data was published as of 2022, and there's they're starting to come out with uh, last year's information. But if you look at a couple of things on here, uh, a couple of things stand out. One. 2016 and 2020, knowingly our last couple of election cycles, and you can see kind of the upward tick. So it's an interesting anecdote in that perhaps that is something we might be able to uh, expect coming into this year, also being an election year. But in line with that, when I also look at this chart over the past couple of years, crime has been down. And from a workplace perspective, and that dotted line for what it's worth, that's that's some I. I use my crayon to uh, to kind of show it. the 2023 data is also trending down as of right now as well. But when you look at this information in the perception in the U.S. is from what I've been seeing in my corner of the world is the perception of crime is still quite high. People are still concerned about commuting to work. People are still concerned about being out in public places, you know, in, in different areas around the country. That perception is still high and same way we were talking about earlier perception for many individuals can be their reality. And so it's interesting. But when you look at the data here, it's actually been in a little bit of a downward trend. So just kind of an interesting anecdote with some of these different things that we're looking at. But crime, regardless, even if it is still down, you know, it's another thing we need to be making sure that we're we're taking into consideration with our with our programs in terms of looking after our folks. Uh, Dave, anything you'd like to add to this one or are we moving forward? Yeah, under yeah, sure, Jake. Under the category of perception is reality, you have to gauge what your people are feeling. I think that's extremely important. So uh, this, kind of a, uh, this kind of a graph, while it's useful uh, for us here for a conversation, isn't helping the person that happens to be embedded in a high crime area. Or, or has known that crime statistics are very different where they are. Uh, that, that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, this is an election year. And uh, without getting into either side, we're either being told uh, things are great or the world is coming to an end. And uh, it's up for us as voters and citizens, but also as members in this community uh, safety security professionals that kind of help filter out what that is and provide context. Context is the key here, right? Uh, people don't want to be told that normally in an election year, crime spikes. Well, that happens to be true. Well, what about 2023? As Jake just pointed out, it's on a downward trend. 15% is much down for violent crime. Hey, that's great news. That doesn't do much for you if you happen to be in an inner city or you happen to be located in an area uh, that really has no uh, semblance of reality to what's happening here. So the message here is pretty clear. Perception is reality. What are your folks feeling? And ask them. Surveys, uh, town halls, uh, when you do your uh, workplace violence prevention or your harassment training, uh, get them into the conversation. Because if they, you know, when, when we, in the world of BTAM, Behavioral Threat Assessment and Management, one of the first things we do is we ask the potential victim, how are you feeling? Do you feel vict uh, victimized? Are you fearful? It's very, very important to understand that. What happens too often sometimes in corporate America, in my professional opinion, is we make an assessment at the mid-level and senior management level of what things actually are. And we miss what's going on underneath. And what happens is when people are fearful, uh, if they don't feel like they're being able to, uh, to make ends meet, uh, you can say the economy is improving all you want. But if, it, if, if, if food is more expensive and gas is going through the roof, it's really hard for people to, to relate to that. And particularly for the si uh, significant but per, uh, minor percentage of people that have trouble coping with life's challenges, they may resort to behaviors uh, inappropriate for themselves and certainly inappropriate for others. And we have to be on the lookout for that. I wasn't kidding when I said we are a much more sensitive society than we have been in the past. How about extremism and hate crimes, Dave? Yeah, I, I think it's really important to point it out. I was, 
you know, back when dinosaurs ruled the earth, I actually got a certification uh, in white supremacist, not how to be one. I want to be clear about that. <laughs> I don't need any nasty email comments. The how-to course was different, but how did That's usually what people think I'm part of, given my beard and yeah, my exactly. bald head. Well, you, you, know you, I mean? you look the part, but never mind. Uh, <laughs> the, the point is, uh, these are folks um, that either don't relate to the establishment, uh, have had problems, coping with life's challenges or have come up with alternate ways of thinking through this. And so what are we talking, what are we talking about? We're just not talking about really scary, uh, ultra nationalist, far right or far left people. And always remember those of you that are on the call that are students of this know it's not a linear spectrum between the far left and the far right. It actually bends over behind itself. It becomes cyclical. So uh, uh, it, it's not useful to say, well, it's the far left. It's not useful to say it's the far right, because uh, both ends of that spectrum can and have uh, exhibited violent tendencies. But something we're seeing a lot more now that you can that I'm actually seeing with my clients is sovereign citizens in the workplace. Uh, and I know that we've got some experts on this call because I did my homework and that can probably talk a lot more about it. But the fact of the matter is that don't recognize the government, don't recognize authority, don't recognize the need to follow rules and regulations. And whereas many times that they're an irritant to us, they're frustrating to us, um, sometimes uh, they will lash out uh, uh, in violence uh, to get their political aims. I will remind you um, that uh, uh, the Oklahoma City bomber uh, was a sovereign citizen not and a white supremacist. Uh, in addition to be lots of other things. And so uh, labeling is only useful to identify what the problem is, but we need to recognize that's why we go by human behavior. So the most immediate concern is violent extremists, individuals or small groups, okay? In uh, inspiration, as we talked about before in the Middle East, but it can also be right here in your backyard. And, and we need to kind of understand that. And that's when I say knocking down stovepipes I always told people when I did embassy work, uh, when someone's coming over the wall, I don't want you to spend time saying who it is. We just need to take appropriate action. So uh, take it from the uh, director of the FBI and those of us that deal with this stuff all the time, still our, our biggest, uh, other than a cyber piece, uh, this is our, our biggest threat right now to the homeland and it can easily find itself into our workplaces. From a workplace around the world kind of perspective, this is one of the last kind of trends that we wanted to talk about with everybody. Um, you know, when we talk about a travel perspective, sending our folks around the world, uh, conflict seems to be popping up in every corner that you can imagine. And, um, you know, a couple of years ago, we would have never thought perhaps that we would have seen actual, you know, uh, conflict and war in Ukraine. Um, you know, it stems back a long ways and there's always been turmoil there, but, you know, there's it just it never ceases to amaze all of these different things going on. But what's interesting is, you know, we have a lot of organizations that we work with that go down to Mexico. You've got the cartel issues down there. You've got territorial disputes around the globe. And it seems like pretty well anywhere you send somebody, there is a different reason or similar reasons to you know, making sure that we're we're preparing our individuals for these in, environments. And, you know, in some of these locations, we've kind of stopped travel altogether and, and pulled everybody out. But it just seems like every single week there's something new spiraling around the world, some sort of event that's popping up. You know, some of these things go way into history. You've got the, um, the Nagorno conflict. Uh, over by Turkey and, and, you know, that territorial dispute there, that, that goes way back into history. But, you know, as of late, is more heated up. And it's it's requiring, again, this global perspective and recognizing when we're sending people around the world, uh, ensuring that, you know, our folks at the front lines in a similar manner, you know, checking in on them of how they're doing and what's going on, but also – making sure that they're prepared to be dealing with these things because we can have all of the support mechanisms, you know, the greatest insurance policy in the world and all of these different things. And those are great, but having that equipped individual when they're the ones traveling around the world, being able to know how to address all of these different things 
you know, if we have to put them into an area that has increased risk, but understanding that, you know, even in areas that we traditionally thought may not have a lot of risk involved from a geographic, you know, geopolitical standpoint, having these different things uh, be part of, at least in the back of our minds and being prepared and in, in preparing our individuals rather to, you know, have a framework of how they engage these different things should something pop up in an area that may not have historically been expected uh, to to see some sort of a conflict. And, um, you know, so it's we've got even domestic travel that is needing to be more and more a consideration of these kinds of issues more than ever, because, you know, some cities that you travel to in the U S even nowadays, you know, there's some serious, some serious opportunity for uh, potential security risk for individuals to, to bump up against, but kind of looking at this as a global perspective and having uh, if nothing else, a way to identify ahead of time, what kind of uh, what the, what the, um, the landscape is looking like out there. You know, it's it's definitely definitely a, a an interesting thing, definitely a trend over the past couple of years, more so than ever. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar, I'm sure everybody is nowadays, given everything that's been going on. But if you don't have a good capability to look at what's going on around the world, the State Department's uh, Overseas Sec Security Advisory Council is a great resource to be able to stay on top of these different things um, and and looking after travelers going around the globe. But Dave, anything on the conflict piece from your perspective? Yeah, I, I think you need to look at it. Um, uh, everything you look at it globally, you look at it regionally, you look at it locally, uh, because all these things can and, and will filter back in uh, a grievance with your company or organization in another part of the world could manifest itself here in the continental United States. So having that 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 uh, strategic uh, protective intelligence component. And from a travel risk management, at a minimum, you need to have pre-departure briefings and training while they're in country or in theater. And the one that's almost always overlooked, which is the debriefing once they come home. And that's how you determine from your particular organizational footprint uh, what your risk level is. Right. And yes, yes of course, uh, making sure everybody registers with the State Department, with the STEP program. Uh, making sure that people have connectivity and they they know who to report, how to report, when to report it. Um, looking after your executives, but anybody that frequently travels, but even domestic travel, there's parts of our own country that require a briefing, to be honest with you, if you're going to go and spend some time from a crime uh, safety standpoint. So it's a good model to have. Uh, our world is smaller than it ever has been. Uh, and it's become of technology, and we need to leverage that technology, uh, but we also can't be a slave to it and recognize and be able to recognize some of these societal uh, and geopolitical uh, trends. And then finally, be prepared for natural disasters. You know, what happens if there's an earthquake in Haiti? What happens if there's an earthquake in Turkey? What happens if we have a flood in um, Thailand and you actually have people there? Uh, you know, from an insurance perspective, but also individual travelers, but then uh, an enterprise wide solution for that. So just a kind of quick question as we kind of keep plugging along here, and then we're going to come in for a landing in terms of all right, from a programmatic, you know, organizational perspective, what do we do about it? But does anybody have any questions they'd like to submit as of as of yet? All right, perfect. Oh, looks like we got a couple maybe coming in. Thumbs are moving on the screens. Talk more sure. about post-travel debriefs in the private sector. Yeah, Dave, you want to take that one or you want me to? Yeah, it can be very simple. It can be informal. It's just almost like an exit interview from when they travel. How did things go? Did you see anything suspicious? Did we prepare you properly before you went? Did you feel like uh, we were looking after you? Any any nuances? That's exactly uh, um, uh, 
kind of what we're talking about. And I will tell you, you if you take the time to do this, you'll learn some things uh, that won't be said. If you don't ask, it's like a deposition. You won't get. And it, that's why it has to be a very important piece. Somebody go, you know what? I saw somebody and I saw the same person four times. I didn't think to report it. It was no big deal. Uh, when you put that with a piece together with the overall program, it can help you kind of understand what that is. So it can be pretty simple. Uh, just debriefing. How did it go? Any problems? Any recommendations? Did we prepare you properly? That type of thing. Uh, and it yes. depends. If you're, a, if you're a government contractor, it might be uh, potential contact concerns, uh, uh, but if it's uh, industrial espionage, uh, anything like that, you know, did we brief you properly? Like when we said to leave your, uh, your, your personal cell phones at home and only take, you know, and don't, don't lock up your company laptop when you're, when you're leaving the hotel, was that good advice? That type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just briefly from my perspective, and then I'll address that other question that popped up is, you know, it can be done in layers as well. If it's routine travel, that information is always going to be useful from the from the perspective of future prevention. So may, maybe it's as simple as a survey that's kind of recurring for folks that they receive as part of their their post trip, you know, kind of coming in for a landing once they get back. Maybe it is an actual personal conversation. But if, as events happen, this is when it becomes increasingly important because that's your opportunity to gather those lessons learned. From information that, you know, as good as, as our intelligence capabilities and all of these different things can be, the individual eyes on the ground that are experiencing these things are going to be just as valuable, if not more valuable. And so gathering the information from them so that we can have real-time capability to incorporate that back into our travel preparation and, and that risk management process that we have. But um, back in my government days, we kind of had three layers to this. We, it, we call it as it's a reintegration program. And if something happened to people, there would be a process that one, we're looking after the, the, the well-being of the individual, but it was very purposeful for debriefing that individual for safety and security related information so as to not have these kinds of issues happen again in the future uh, and incorporating that all back in. Sometimes that process, depending on the event, you know, can take several days uh, to work through. And obviously, you know, that's not necessarily the norm for, for corporate travel and these things, but having a mechanism built in, planning it into your program to be able to capture that information. Uh, and then just briefly, I saw that other question in terms of, do we, do we as an organization build plans? Yes, we do. We can talk more about that at the end of the, at the program, uh, if, if you'd like to have more information, but you're probably referencing SB 553, that's that's part of our core business model is, is helping organizations build that program. But as it relates to all of these trends we're talking about, just briefly, um, you know, when we're talking about personnel safety and security uh, from a trend moving into the future, where I believe we need to go as organizations is the safety and security of our individuals, regardless of where they're working. Historically, and maybe even kind of pre-pandemic timeframes, some of these different things were stovepiped. You might have a travel risk management program that's in a stovepipe. You might have a workplace violence prevention program. But bringing all of these different things under one umbrella, uh, in some ways this is already happening in, in some areas that I've been kind of seeing. But how are you looking after the individuals regardless of where they're working for the home environment, for maybe they're out working in the public? Maybe it is those individuals traveling around the world. It's all part of the same spectrum. So policies and procedures. How are we addressing the conduct that we expect of our people from working from home, working in the day-to-day -day office, working out in the public? If there are behaviors that are, are concerning and that are starting to uh, be at a minimum a level that's inappropriate for the workplace, what's the reporting mechanism for all of these different things? From a training perspective, how are we equipping our individuals to be aware of the different concerns they need to be mindful of? What do they do about it? How do they individually respond? Um, how do they get assistance for these different things? And looking at each of these different lenses of where you have people working so that we have capabilities in place, have a mechanism in place to receive information and then adequately respond to information and or threats and or incidents as and, and when they occur. So do we know where our people are working is one. 
how are we providing further protection as an organization? But then the opposite side of this is how are we actually equipping our individuals to be an adequate, um, an adequate uh, part of the mechanism to bring that information back? What is their responsibility in this process? And so it's a push and pull both ways, the organizational perspective and the individual perspective. What is your expectation of people from a safety and security mindset if they're working out in the public? If they have an engagement with somebody that is, you know, can, has a problem with your organization for whatever reason, what are you expecting your individuals to do? How are we de-escalating common day-to-day -day issues? If somebody, maybe they're a salesperson going into grocery stores and somebody tries to confront them, how are we setting them up for success to de-escalate these situations? What's the personal security standpoint of all of these different things that commute to and from work, you know, providing a way for you know, potential crime to be avoided. And so looking at this as a holistic spectrum from policies and procedures, that training layer, and then of course, having that means to address these threats as they come up is another aspect of this as well. So Dave, uh, that's your component of this that we can bring in for a landing. Yeah, so uh, behavioral threat assessment and management, the, you know, the compliance documents, the, the OSHA directive, the two ASIS uh, standards, uh, require a multidisciplinary approach to threat management. And by the way, this should not be something separate, often that it, like a star chamber in a smoke-filled room. This should be tied in uh, with your workplace violence prevention intervention program uh, when Jake is talking about a holistic program. So it requires a multidisciplinary team training. And if you have an international footprint, you need to have representation of the regions that you're in. I have several clients that have done an excellent job. They do a lot of work in uh, Europe and the Pacific Rim and the Middle East. Uh, and when I when I deal with their threat management groups as a consultant uh, or as a, an assessment professional, um, these folks know what the expectation is. They're able to bring the local perspective on some of these things, and we're we're able to put together a much richer uh, assessment of the potential uh, threat that an organization may face. Training, very specific training. Uh, I will remind everybody that out of all the compliance documents to include the California legislation, which sadly doesn't even mention behavioral threat assessment and management, I think that's a real that's a real shame. I hope it's it, 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 it they catch up with that. But the point is, uh, it's the only training that you may not do internally is behavioral threat assessment and management. The compliance documents st strictly say. It's got to be outside expert training and to so make sure that everybody's working together as a team, multidisciplinary, because it walks, talks, sounds like your organization. Uh, so, the, so the entire breadth and girth of your organization is represented in some way, shape or form on that team. Have a incident management process, not just crisis management, not just when the balloon goes up, but what we call right of bang. Yeah, after we have a, pro a crisis Yes, we have to have these management processes, but before uh, prevention, responding as it's going on. So these predetermined processes, not just for headquarters, not just for the continental U.S., but wherever uh, your, your footprint is as an organization. And then two points to this, the use of external experts, people that have expertise in areas like behavioral threat assessment and management, um, uh, uh, for example, I'm a certified threat manager. There's several hundreds, hundred of us around the country, but there's other people that are very skilled in that regard, because occasionally you're going to run into a case or a fact set that's going to be above everybody's pay grade as far as potential danger uh, and concern. So you have this together at your disposal to put together a comprehensive threat, uh, threat management program. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Well, with that, everybody, I know we're kind of coming up on the hour here, but we also want to provide opportunity for asking questions here. Um, the first one that we got here, you can submit these into the Slido system and they'll, they'll kind of pop up on the screen. But do you expect faith-based org faith organizations to have a higher risk level than other industries in today's threat environment or equal to other industries? Um, in some ways, yes. In other ways, I would say not necessarily. Um, it depends, and I guess if it depends on risk level for what, uh, as well, potential violence, um, you know, it kind of depends, but <clears throat> historically there's kind of been some, 
some known high risk industries. You've got your healthcare type industries of the world. You know, you've got your late night retails and these different things. But for certain things, I would say it's certainly an elevated risk level, especially if you have, you know, uh, groups that are diametrically opposed to what you're you're putting out there as an organization. Um, then yeah, you might want to be mindful of those different things. But regardless, uh, having a mechanism to be aware of people that are threatening your organization is the starting place for all of it, regardless. And you know, have that catch-all to be able to have a threat management kind of capability in place. But Dave, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, I've got quite a few actually. Uh, I'll try to keep it succinct. The short answer is um, yes, faith-based organizations, based upon my professional opinion. Uh, oftentimes do face a potential higher risk level. In fact, the FBI specifically names faith-based organizations uh, potential potential problems, particularly when you think of things like hate crimes uh, as it ties in. Every, in my view, and I've done a lot of work with uh, faith-based organizations over the years, every organization needs to have a mechanism in place internally and externally to, ass to assess the likelihood of violence and how you're going to deal with those, whether they be safety and security teams uh, or whatever that might be. So yes, uh, I, I, I think that uh, Jake is quite right. It depends on the organization. It depends on what you're trying to accomplish. But the fact of the matter is uh, faith-based organizations uh, certainly have uh, face a much more significant threat um, than they have in the past. Um, Jake, do you want to take the second one? Yeah, for the California piece, y'all, no, it's it's not required for the California legislation specifically. It's it's a standards piece uh, from the historical American national standards, specifically for behavioral threat assessment and management. It's not necessarily like awareness training and those sorts of things. But uh, feel free to continue submitting questions, y'all. We want to be mindful of everybody's time here, and we'll we'll get back to everybody you know, in writing with an FAQ kind of thing. Um, but I do want to at least put up this webinar for a response in terms of, we'd love your feedback on this in terms of the content, you know, what you thought of it, uh, you know, ideas for the future of different things you want us to talk about. But um, also with that, Allison, you know, I know you had some things that you wanted to share with every everybody as well. Uh, so I'll pass it yeah. over to you. Yeah, thank you. So we are uh, super excited to be launching our new workplace violence fundamental training. Um, it meets that all employee training for workplace violence prevention. And I just wanted to share a quick preview of this program for those of you that have time to uh, stay. And then if you're interested in seeing a full demo of the program, um, you can reach out to our team at info at cpps.com and we can get a full demo of this to you. But um, we just launched it and we wanted you guys to be the first to be able to see it. So I'm just gonna play through a little preview of it. And then, uh, if, like I said, if you wanna see the whole thing, feel free to email 